I'm very glad that uh, all of you got out of bed this morning to uh, hear about trust. Um, I'm sure you heard that Boris Johnson, for example, just withdrew as um, a contender for prime minister in the UK. That is really the Game of Thrones over there, I would say. Um, but it's really important to understand what happened last week, Brexit, in the context of trust. Because what happened was, for the first time, all that um, we've been talking about in terms of the differences between the elites and the mass population came to bear. And here are some statistics that maybe you've already seen, but if you haven't, you should know them. Um, the top 10 lever province um, constituencies, South Holland, Castle Point, Yarmouth, voting 75% to leave, more or less, the income weekly is between 300 pounds and 388 pounds. 300 and 388. Now, the top 10 stayers, well, the city of London, <coughs> Edinburgh, places where people made money. The gap between those who are college plus educated and those who are not is vast by four to one difference. Um, the uh, same thing with young and old. Um, the young by a large margin, two to one, stay. The 50 plus, two to one, go. So these are just statistics that frame the proposition. Just appreciate that Edelman's been following trust in institutions for the last 16 years. We do this in 28 countries. Um, we survey um, something like 36,000 people. Um, we do it in October and November every year. And, you know, there have been a series of trust shocks um, over the 16 years, um, the greatest of which was obviously the, you know, huge implosion of the financial markets in 2008. It is our strong conviction that what we're seeing today is a delayed reaction to 2008. That in fact, it took people a long time to come around to the idea that uh, I'm actually not going to get back to where I was. In fact, my future is actually quite dim. They have lost confidence in the future. The thing that I want to establish with you is the magnitude of the gap between the informed publics and the mass population. Who is an informed public? It is college plus educated. It is four plus media a day. It is $75,000 plus income. That just establishes who these people are. What's happened since 2008 is a flatlining of the mass population. They went down and they never came back up in terms of trust in institutions of business, government, media, and NGOs. Flatline. What happened to the elites is gradually since 2008 and in an accelerating way, the trust in institutions on the part of the elites has gone up so that we are today in a place where between the top 25% of income earners and bottom 25% income earners, there's a 31 point gap in trust in institutions in the United States. And it's all because of 70% trust of the elites, 40% trust in mass population. If you wanna understand the jaws of the dragon, Donald Trump comes right out of that statistic. Yep, trust in Trump, five letters, Massive difference in outcome. Um, so basically, it is not simply an American issue. That gap is 20 points in the UK. It is 29 points in France. It is 22 points in India. It is 15 points in China. So appreciate that whether you're in a country where the economy is going OK, rising, in theory, you know, India, whether you're in a country like France that's struggling in economy, this is a global problem. And the gap is accelerating over the last five years. And you see um, what I believe is the end of the grand illusion. And here was the grand illusion. You probably all studied C. Wright Mills in college. C. Wright Mills, the pyramid of influence. And the elites were at the top, and they went to Ivy League schools or, you know, and more or less, here was the grand bargain. The elites have better information than we do. The elites have our backs, meaning that they are acting in our interest. And lastly, if I really work hard and get lucky, I can be one of those elites someday. 
Well, that illusion is now over. And it may have taken eight years to get to that understanding. It may have taken from 2008 to 2016. But immigration, the consequences of globalization, and terrorism have all forced people to reconsider the proposition. And they're angry. They're angry because median income hasn't risen for 30 years. They're angry because they feel that the 1% has basically gotten all the gains in the last eight years. And they feel that the government, in a way, did the bailout in order that the elites could get ahead. That's the basic proposition. So there are a lot of long-term trends and trusts that I want to identify, but none more important than this. We see that the C. Wright Mills pyramid of influence is now turned upside down. That there's a just major now distinction between influence and authority. Influence rests with the mass population. Authority still rests with the class at the top. So just think about the pyramid of influence, C. Wright Mills flipped, and, what, and why do I say this? The number one credible source of information today is either a professor or a person like me. Now think about that. A person like myself, that's a friend. That's someone maybe who's not a real friend, but just a friend on Facebook, someone who knows somebody else. I am now getting my information, not from the top down, I'm getting it horizontally. It is coming peer to peer. And this is consequential because a person like me is now twice as credible as a CEO or a government leader. A fellow employee is twice as credible as, an, as a CEO. We have a reversal of traditional influence. It is going from not top down, it's going sideways. So remember, in your head, no longer vertical, it's horizontal. And think about the consequence of this for marketers. Leonard, pay attention here. 75% of people make decisions on brands based on peer conversations, not on advertising. You cannot buy attention. You cannot buy brand loyalty. It is based on people's experiences. And why is it that brands that are unicorns are relying on communities? social communities, rating, Airbnb, Uber drivers. It's because it is about horizontal. It is about peer experience. This is a fundamental change, folks. Here's another fundamental change. We see a catastrophic decline in trust in government all around the world. It started, again, with the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, now it's gone to the developing markets. Listen to some statistics. The gap between business trust and government trust in markets such as Mexico, Brazil, South Africa is 50 points. Trust in South Africa government is 10 points. They can't govern. They can't run things. And it's 20%, 20 percentage points in France, Spain, Italy, Poland, Malaysia, etc. More or less, what you've seen in the last few years is decline in government, rise in business. Why? Business gets stuff done. We may not love them, we don't love them, but they get things done. Government, incapable and unable. NGOs, non-governmental organizations are the most trusted institution in trust in, in our survey, and they have been for years. Here's what's happened. Started very high in Europe, came on in America, and have risen substantially in developing markets. Now equal to government, believe it or not, in China. <clears throat> what we see is localization of NGOs, not Greenpeace China, it is whatever local brand in China. That's key. And these are independent actors and cannot be controlled from uh, center. Hello, Garrett. Um, media, Shelby will talk about this in a little while. It is a slow, grinding fade in trust in media. Shelby and I were just commiserating. Trust in America in media right now is at an all-time low of 8%. Count it, 8%. Here's what we have. 
we have created a world of self-reference. Search and social have now become more important than mainstream media for the average American, along with opinion television. And also, it's deeply important this morning that Facebook has tweaked its algorithm again to change the news feed to promote that which is recommended by your friends. I repeat, Facebook's algorithm no longer favors the importance of news, it favors that which your friends recommend. Peer-to-peer, -peer, horizontal world. For the elites, it's newspapers, magazines, and then search and social. It's the other way around for the mass population. Therefore, we're living in an echo chamber where people have their opinions reinforced by their friends. If I see what I want to see, it's because my friends see it, you know, and they tell me about it. I want to spend the most time of my presentation about business because it's the rising force, but it's business done differently because 80% of people today believe that business can make a profit and improve society. That is a new expectation and a new belief in business. And they believe this, A, because of what they observe, and B, because of what they need. And that key last point is important, because they're not getting it from anywhere else. They may like NGOs, but they don't believe NGOs get stuff done. They think that NGOs criticize in order to get things done. Business is most trusted of all the four institutions to keep pace with innovation. Business is also increasingly, importantly, having rise in trust with CEOs. It's not good, but it's better than it was. It was a really all-time low in 2008. Can't imagine why. Um, industry. Tech is the most trusted industry consistently across the world, has been as long as we've been doing the survey. Had a little bump down because of privacy, um, but has recovered. Financial services continues to be the least trusted institution, um, and particularly bad in Western Europe. Note this, that is the industry that manifests the biggest gap between the ordinary person and the elites. Example, 30 point difference. The elites think financial services are just great. The mass population in the US despises banks. Despises is the word. Um, by national brand, there's also a huge difference between being a Canadian, a German, a Swedish, or a Swiss company, and being a Chinese, Russian, Mexican or Brazilian, like 40 points difference, and particularly developing market companies coming into the developed markets. Huge skepticism about the ethics of Chinese and Russian companies. Can't imagine why again. Um, by the way, American brands, because many of you work for American companies, um, down because of Iraq, recovery, down because of the Great Recession, recovery. So not in the top five, but more or less in the top seven national brands. If your hope was number one, no way. Um, types of company. Family companies have a tremendous advantage in trust. Again, Leonard, you should comment about this later, but the aspect of family business, two to one trust over a large public company. The larger the family company gets, that trust advantage diminishes, but it still maintains at like one and a half to one. That is not true in Asia. Family companies are seen as corrupt in Asia. Great, no surprise. Also. Key point, private company now describes private equity company. If you want to be a family company, be a family company, but private doesn't help you anymore. So don't call yourselves a private company. Um, private also implies lack of transparency. <laughs> um, I want to leave you with some hope. I don't want to leave you depressed. There is a path forward. And the first point is about leadership. The second is about having a new value proposition which is beyond the numbers, beyond performance. Um, and third, and most important of all, employees are your most credible spokespeople. Why? In a world of peer-to-peer, -peer, employees talking to others, deeply, deeply important. Okay, let's talk about the CEO. Two-thirds of countries have under 50% trust in CEOs. In the US, UK, France, 30% people trust CEOs. Pretty bad. Why? They're overpaid. They do not relate to me. How about this? Um, a majority of Americans cannot name a single CEO. If they can name CEOs, let's have a little show of hands here. Who can they name? Let's have a names. Come on. Who can people name? Go. 
Who? Mm. No. Tim Cook, yes. No. No. Come on, guys, tech. Yes. Who else? Who else? Yes, but we know him. Yes. Who else? No, they can't name either of the Googles. No. Nope. Bill Gates. Very good. I understand he hasn't been for 10 years, but they still think of him as a CEO. Who else was in the top three? Someone who's dear and departed. You're a winner. Um, and uh, Nadella, who was here yesterday. So who are all these people? They're in tech. They talk. And you actually know something about them. Uh, what do people think about CEOs right now, in addition to what I said already? They're very focused on short-term financial gain. They are focused on lobbying. Uh, and they're invisible. We don't know anything about them. It's a sort of sad story. What do people want out of CEOs? Let's do a little show of hands here. Just name some words. What would you want in your CEO? Leadership. Nope. Nope. Not about performance. It's not about stability. What? Integrity. Now we're on to the hot buttons. Here we go. That's number one. Yep. What else? Come on. Other words that sound like integrity? Yes. Good. Two. Ethics. What's a, what's a synonym to that? Starts with an H. Ends with a T. Yes. Those are the three top things. Now, what else do they want? Competent. Transparent. What don't they want? What don't they value? Innovative. Visionary. Nope. They assume that. That's table stakes, folks. The 2008 recession, when I tell you that it changed the world, these aspects of a CEO behavior tell you everything. And who is it who's succeeding now as CEOs? Paul Pullman of Unilever about sustainability, Mark Benioff stepping up on LGBT, Howard Schultz on race and opportunity, Indra Nui on performance and purpose. The new bar is you can't just make money. That's not what people want. Here's what people want. They told us specifically, operations and new products are table stakes for companies. That's just the way you do business. Here's the new thing. Tell me about a company that has integrity and tell me about a company that engages with me and I will trust that company. What comprises integrity? Ethical business practices and transparency. What comprises engagement? Do you treat your employees well? Do you value your customers over profits? And do you listen to customer feedback? If you do those things, you will be a trusted company. Last point, your most credible spokesperson for the company is your employee. It is not your CEO. Your CEO may think he or she is, but he or she would be wrong. And it's on things you wouldn't expect. Yes, you would expect it on maybe treatment of customers. Employees might know about that. But on operational performance and on business practices, by two to one, employees are more credible than CEOs. Why? Well, we've had a lot of CEOs who've been liars. <laughs> Just put it where it is. Um, or CEOs who, you know, tell one thing to Wall Street and tell another thing to a community. So people find that out. Here's another key point for you. Societal engagement by the company raises employee commitment and motivation by 15 to 20 points. It's a freebie. I'm going to say that again. Societal engagement by a company raises employee commitment and motivation by 15 to 20 points. If you're just doing your business, then go do your business. But you're missing this free opportunity to get ahead. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to conclude by telling you that trust has tangible consequences. People who trust your company will buy its products and services, recommend those products to friends, and share their opinions online in a way that makes further sales possible. If they don't trust you, they will blast your products, they will not buy them, and 
they won't even buy your shares. Trust in institutions no longer is automatically granted because of your hierarchy or your title. We basically are living in a flat world. If a CEO, even if it's the CEO, is not a decent person, is not somehow expressing and doing the proper thing, it do doesn't automatically mean that the person is trusted. Trust has to be earned by your actions. It is not about communication, it is about what you do. And I think the what you do has to comprise an aspect of inclusive growth because the idea somehow of unfettered capitalism and Milton Friedman and the only job of corporations is to make profit, that's a yesterday concept. The new concept is business filling a gap left by government and acting in both the shareholder's interest as well as societal interest. Thank you very much. <laughs> 20 minutes remaining, just on time, perfect. All right, so um, Shelby, what is your reaction to um, the comments about media? You knew I was gonna call on you, I prepared you, so hit it. And Leonard's next on business, so. Okay. I say today we're at 8%, but I see it tomorrow where we could be at 9%, 10%. <laughs> the question is, since you, in, you had their notes of hopefulness, what do you see as a path uh, for the media? Because one of the elements in the, in the decline of trust in the media has clearly been that on the political side, for at least 30 years, there have been regular attacks on the media. It's a standard thing. If you've got a bad story, uh, blame the messenger, shoot the messenger. And over time, I think that has, that has weighed heavily. But there is still, I think, a very strong uh, elite media that is working uh, hard uh, along the old qualities of giving context, and, uh, and putting stories in balance that is at odds with a, a very, an even stronger cable television and internet uh, world of opinion blasters who are going to get a great deal more interest by throwing flames than by giving a detailed, lengthy story on the major issues. So, so, how, so shall how, we, does, it's, it's, how does the elite media combat the interest that is immediately there uh, uh, for the flamethrowers. So I think it's really important that we look at the segments of the media that are growing. Um, vice media, um, and you may right away go, Dracula, Satan, um, and, and you might be right, but um, the truth of the matter is that Vice has a huge market share in the sort of 15 to 25 year old um, demographic and the why. It's deeply visual, it's got a point of view, um, it's reporting stories others aren't, um, it's finding ways to put its content onto HBO or other um, broader dissemination platforms, um, and somehow it seems to reflect its demographic. It doesn't feel um, as if preachy. You know, it feels, you know, from the bottom up. and. Um, like, here, here's a view of the sewage plant in your neighborhood in Brooklyn. You know, what? Who cares? Well, but that's a human interest story um, as opposed to the, you know, once or twice a week column in the New York Times about, you know, oh, Brooklyn is really on fire. You know, great. No, no, it's a different way of looking at the world, right? So I think the mainstream media better take a page from this and reinvent itself. And arguably, maybe they should have, as Leonard does, um, a set of brands as opposed to one brand. You know, think about the media as, uh, the, the way as I look at it, what the media is trying to do is enhance its verticals. So New York Magazine is now having a whole, like, like a theater vertical or a food vertical or a fashion vertical. That's one way to look at it, but the way I actually would think it's better is there's a demographic. Again, Leonard, you should comment on this, but you've got brands that appeal to teens and appeal to the 40s, and, but I don't think the media does that very well. And they're getting flanked as a result. 
Mr. Louder, the voice of reason on business. I wish I were more, more reasonable. Anyway, listen, uh, S.G. Lauder. S.G. Lauder is one name, but we happen to have uh, 34 different brands. Most people don't know uh, that we own them all because we never put a name on them. The reason we do that is that if one of them gets in trouble, uh, that's like a firewall. So uh, I've spent most of my working life uh, trying to get ahead of the curve and being a firefighter. But let me give you a little story about how, how right Richard is about who trusts who. Uh, we had a problem some years ago, a really serious problem, uh, which started in, of all places, Australia. It was a product, it, it, was an, it was an ingredient problem. Then it went to Singapore. Then it went to Hong Kong. Then it went to Taiwan. And it went on and on and on. And we had to stop it. We had to stop it. How do we stop it? So one of the people pushing very hard for it was a comp an, an, an NGO in Washington, the Consumer Federation of America. So I went to see them. I walked in there. And they looked at me. Where's your lawyer? I said, that's me. And they said, you're alone? I said, yes. I said, look, I've been working at this company since I was 25. I was running what I was doing at $800,000 worth of sales. My life is in this. And it's my job to make sure that things are right, not wrong. And no lawyer can tell you that. That was OK. And it sort of took care of it. So the point is, trust is not a new thing that we're looking at today. OK, it didn't exist before. It still exists again and again and again and again. So you have to remember that who do you trust and how do you, ex how do you explain who, who you are so people can trust you? And most of our government people don't know a thing about what to say. Okay. Thank you. Our museum, new men. Jeff Herb from the museum. Museum in Washington, D.C. on Museum. Museum of Nuzi. News. For those of you who haven't been, have to go. I understand the presentation is very persuasive. I'm having a harder time understanding how it maps onto the current political campaign where one party has nominated, presumptively, a CEO. Uh, the other party has nominated, presumptively, a person with long-standing experience in big government who ran against a person who argued that big government was the solution to more social problems. I might have expected from the results that a mayor or a governor who had more experience with the type of problem solving that you describe as persuasive might have received more political traction. Is that further evidence that elites don't get it or that the trust uh, deficit that you describe is still delayed in terms of affecting national politics. So I would define Donald Trump not as a CEO, but actually as an entrepreneur, small business, cum family business. And that's his secret. He's running against big business. He's running against the establishment. Um, I, I want to leave the Hillary thing to the side because it was in a way sort of her turn and she'd been aced out by Obama last time and um, and, and, and she almost lost to Sanders, who I think bespeaks more of the data. Um, but Trump is a phenomenon also in running against the classic marketing paradigm. Appreciate that he has spent almost nothing on advertising, that he has 8 million Twitter followers, that his primary means of communication is 140 characters. And it's a news story every day. He's as if he's his own brand. You know, he, and, and, and he is conducting himself as a social brand as opposed to an establishment brand. He's a challenger brand. Um, 
and he's gotten away with it, um, in part because he's news, he's copy. Um, CNN loves him. Ratings are five times up. Um, but it seems to me he's reflecting the deep animus people have with the way in which things have been sold before. Catch this. 50% of Americans believe that uh, marketers are liars. They think that uh, by two to one, marketers are liars. Um, they see that pictures are altered. They see that there's a push for obsolescence. So, you know, you've had this new Apple phone, you better get the next Apple phone because it's the Apple 7 instead of the Apple 6. And of course, the Apple 7 has much better cameras and other, you know. They are irritated about this, and they're also scared of the pace of innovation. By two to one, people think innovation's going too quickly. When you really get to the guts of what Trump stands for, he stands for retro. Dwight D. Eisenhower, in a certain way. You know, America is the great and solo big player. It's ridiculous, but it's a hark back to the good old days. The small business, the, you know, I can, better negotiate than the other one. This sounds like somebody I've heard bragging, you know, at golf clubs, you know, like, oh man, just let me at that club again, you know, give me a break. But it's working. It's the antithesis, that's why it's working. It's my thesis. In the back? It's a long way for the microphone, but start. deficit that you describe, yep. but at the same time, there seems to be, we seem, consumers in their everyday activities seem to put a lot of trust into technology companies. So yep. we let people uh, track our whereabouts, uh, scan our emails for marketing purposes, etc. Can you just talk a little bit about that paradox? I think people are willing to make technology companies almost an exception because they deliver value and they deliver speed and they deliver um, the promise of, of, of better, it makes my life better. Um, that trade-off works pretty well. It's why the privacy and security uh, issues haven't really uh, disturbed so much. And you haven't had a scandal um, of, of a company's own doing, malfeasance, like you have in financial services or Volkswagen in cars or, or, or things like this. Um, so. <clears throat> anyway, te tech is also seen as the, uh, the best employer, uh, the place I want to work. Um, the stocks have been really good performers. They have like five virtues. Um, and now they're starting to give back. You know, Benioff um, on LGBT and becoming a big advocate, Tim Cook similarly. So again, I think they're answering a lot of that engagement and integrity kind of stuff. Um, and the products are really important. Yes. Hi, I'm Tara Montgomery. I'm from Consumer Reports, which has always been one of the top trusted brands yep. among consumers, but also among government people, which is interesting. But we're based in science, and you didn't mention science or academia as one of the institutions, and I wondered what you thought was a solution to kind of maintain public trust in science and scientists. You know, um, one of the problems uh, with uh, science at the moment is and, and, and one of the problems on, on attitudes and trust towards innovation is people's lack of belief in the contradictory studies. Um, genetic modification, of all the categories that we looked at, even if it's a 20-year-old um, innovation, it has the lowest trust. Compare that to Fitbits or other you know, pieces of sort of health innovation, those have very high um, bits of, of, of trust levels. So, I think people are skeptical about warring experts, if I can put it this way. They just want the truth. And if they can't get the truth from the experts, they're gonna get it from their friends. And friends give you their own experience. Sir. My name is Chris Gates and I'm from New York. Um, and I'm an employee. And I'm an employee of a financial services company. And uh, I have the privilege of working with a couple of guys who are writing a book on integrity. And we just put out a paper called Putting Integrity into Finance. Uh, my question is about the future. And what you shared today is about the future. 
Um, and the funny thing about the future is it never gets here. It's only ever now. It's only ever a story you're telling in the present. What's the story you would like to tell? Or what could you create or what could you say about the future that might create a context into which different actions could arise that Look, would bring I mean, us integrity? I, I, I would have a very specific point of view about financial services. I think the, whatever people hear is about how much the top people make and why people are in the business in order to make money as opposed to how the customers benefit. You know, which startups did you finance and, 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 and how have you changed um, your, your values at the organization to reflect this new ethos of societal impact, not just uh, personal gain? And, uh, you know, Garrett, you're a good example of someone who's been in Wall Street and now doing societal impact, so go ahead. But you have to comment on that one first, since you're my friend. <laughs> Make it a question for me again, sorry. No, no, I mean, just why financial institutions continue to have FX scandals and, and mortgage um, yeah. issues. And I, I think it's leadership, really. I mean, I think going back to an earlier day on Wall Street when more people owned their companies and more people knew their leadership, uh, there was a much higher expectation that you wouldn't do something that would put the company at risk. And it's... Uh, in the kind of me, me, uh, winner take all world, there's a high degree of turnover, there's a high degree of disassociation from the leadership and, ha and a company that has some meaning to them personally. Yeah. So the stuff that happens is, is sometimes it's at the core of the business and the boss has been intimidated by a profit maker, but a lot of times it's also some errant ninja financial player who's, who's out there doing something that gets caught. And uh, so it's- All right, a, so your question? You, you talked to a lot of CEOs, and I was really interested to hear your, your comments about people's rising expectations for businesses to play a bigger role in, in society. Um, most people who I talk to who have followed and read about corporate social responsibility um, and, and the, the role of business in society are pretty cynical about um, what the typical CEO is trying to do in that area. And, I'm just wondering what you see when you are here, when you talk to CEOs about this, because I've seen a lot of very disparate things. I see a lot of cynicism and the kind of this is a thing we need to do, but I've also seen companies who, uh, where they really are making a genuine effort to have so an Gary, here's, here's what I would say. It's been a long path, and some companies started out with having philanthropy, and then they moved to sort of CSR, corporate social responsibility, and then they moved to cause marketing, um, now, you actually see companies changing their operations in order to either save money or, and or um, benefit society. So PepsiCo helping farmers in Mexico to grow better corn so they can get Doritos made but from a higher quality product, that's smart for everybody. Um, and that's the nature, I think, of the change. For consumer product goods companies like Unilever and Pepsi, there's right. a f also a fair amount of cynicism about, hey, this is a marketing scheme, right? We're going to do a lot of advertising about what we do with Mexican farmers. I'm more interested to hear what you think about, like, companies that don't have an obvious gain other than perhaps being a better citizen and being more popular with their employees. Do companies, do CEOs that you talk to, perceive that and have a genuine interest in trying to figure that out, or is it more still a kind of, how do I fend this off? Again, you well, I think, to, Gar you I think Garrett, is, it's on a spectrum. Some, some say, well, what's the least I can do to stay out of trouble? <laughs> and some say, look, this is a tre tremendous opportunity. You know, Unilever is the third most attractive place in the world for a person getting out of school to go work after Facebook and Google. Unilever, oh my God, 10 years ago was seen as the British bureaucracy. So you know, the Dove Campaign for Real Beauty or the Vaseline Healing Project or all these things, it really excites the best to want to work for a CPG company. So, and companies have a much better ability to affect change than, business, than government at the moment. Let me get to the next question, yes. You talked about NGOs and their role and, what, and how we can build trust. In the NGO world, sh would you recommend that NGOs focus on building trust by using data as you described, it's, it's, it's more tangible. B 
because a lot of NGOs use sense of urgency and, and drama and... and it's, a, it's an excellent point. I would say the NGOs now are the fifth estate in global governance, and they have to step their game up. And I think what we've seen with NGO trust is it's leveled and actually sinking. And NGOs are not seen as innovative, particularly less than business, for instance. NGOs are seen as non-transparent about their funding sources in many cases. Um, and NGOs' governance methods are now being questioned. So you're, you're in the big leagues. You've got to step it up and have performance metrics. Yep, Fred. And then question. Yeah, I run a real quick. Yeah, I run a nonprofit that does placemaking for communities. Your people found us uh, for Southwest Airlines. Right. We have a program, 18 cities we've worked in, two of them. Detroit, we put a beach in the center of the city. Albuquerque, we did something in a totally empty space in the center of downtown. All these people started flocking to it. Southwest Airlines has all these volunteers that are, act or, are there helping people to use those places. Uh, the CEO comes to these places and he hugs the people. Uh, you, I think it epitomizes what you're saying. It's just a marvelous experience. And I was scared when they came to us. We didn't ever think we would get a corporation to do anything like what we were doing. Good. I'm happy. Yes, yes. Quick, quick. Yeah, do you... Um, Lightning round. Uh, yeah. Do you trust... Uh, do you track the uh, differences in trust between women leaders and man, men leaders? That's a good question for next year. <laughs> the answer is no, we don't. But trust of men and of women in very little difference. Age is different. Millennials more trusting than others. Millennials trust institutions still. Last question. Well, second to last question, real quick. Quick one. Hi, Jonathan Greenblatt with ADL. Quick question. You talked about corporations going from CSR to cost marketing to supply chains. What does your trust barometer tell you about big corporations that go and acquire ethical brands like Coke and Honest Tea or some of the other examples that we've seen? Well, what I see is that Ben & Jerry is actually moving Unilever over. So it's, good, it's actually good for both. Last question. Yep, that's you. I was wondering whether or not you talked about this self-referential uh, sort of trust and the people are looking to friends yeah. and their own opinions and the sort of the, the echo chamber. Do you think there's any chance that after we look at the response to Brexit and we look at sort of uh, people seeing their own opinions being thrown back at them that maybe the elites and maybe people will start listening to the elites or that there will be some sea change in this or are we destined to have people just looking for their own opinions thrown back at them. I mean, the, the establishment couldn't have made a harder push for the uh, Remain, IMF, World Bank, the Exchequer, President Obama, etc. Like, of course they would say that. They're all, the, you know, representing the, the establishment. We reject that. Yeah, maybe there will be, a, your, your point is, are we in a cycle? I don't know that we're in the worst part of the cycle yet. You could see Marion Le Pen and, and a few others and the T word here, which we can't have, but yeah. Okay, anyway, zero minutes remaining, thank you very much.